So in this video, we're going to work through certain examples on Grice's maxim picture conversation. And we're going to see on his picture how the maxims actually help generate implicatures, how they help us see where implicatures might actually come from. So we're going to go through each of the categories, quantity, quality, relation, and manner. And we're going to see an implicature in each case generated by the appearance that somebody isn't following one of these maxims. The first example we'll use is one we saw earlier. So remember the question and answer exchange. So somebody asks, what are Professor Boylan's lectures like? And the person re responds, well, he has very nice handwriting. There we saw that this clearly carries the implicature that I'm not a very good lecturer, I'm not a good professor. So this is actually, according to Grice, this kind of example is actually an example of a quantity implicature. And let's think about why that's the case. So if you just respond by saying, or somebody just responds by saying, well, he has very nice handwriting, then have they given all the information that was required by the question? It looks like no, they've fallen far short if that's all they're trying to say. Because if somebody asks you the question, what do they like as a lecturer? They want to know far more than just about my handwriting. They may not even want to know about my handwriting at all. So it looks like initially the person responding has not given all the information that they're required to give. And so Grace's idea is that in a situation like this, the audience will, will spot this. They'll say, okay, well, what they're literally saying doesn't give all the information that's required. But I know that deep down they're following the cooperative principle, so they really are on some level obeying this. But if they really are obeying, in particular, this maxim of quantity, then it must be that they're trying to communicate something extra. And what extra could they be communicating in this case? Well, it looks like in this case, the best explanation or the best, your best guess as to what information, what extra information they might be trying to communicate, is they're trying to communicate that I'm not a bad professor. Why is that a good explanation in this case? Well, because we know as a general matter of fact, sometimes we don't like to badmouth people, and we try to avoid saying anything if we can't say something nice. Remember what your mother taught you. But in the case, so in this case, the audience will be able to think, well, the fact that they haven't said anything more probably means that they believe he's a bad lecturer. Because if they thought he was a good lecturer, or they were good things, presumably they would have said them. So it must be that the speaker thinks that David Boyle is a bad lecturer. But now notice, if that is what they really meant to communicate, if they meant to implicate that I'm a bad lecturer, then they're no longer violating the quantity maxim, because David Boyle is a bad lecturer is a very good answer to the question, what are David Boyle's lectures like? If that's what they meant to communicate, they would no longer be violating the maxim of quantity. And so the audience will tend to conclude that that is what's meant, because that gives a good explanation of how the person is being cooperative, even though they appear not to be being cooperative. So that's an example where a violation or an apparent violation of a quantity maxim leads the audience to infer more than what just what the speaker has literally said, in a way that the speaker has intended for them to do so. Let's think about another example that involves the quality maxims. So Grice gives the example of somebody asks, well, something like, where does Carol live? And the answer is somewhere in the south of France. Now in certain contexts, again, this looks like it will violate the quantity maxim because somewhere in the south of France is a pretty vague answer. There's a lot of, there's a lot of the south of France. There's a lot of different places that she could be in, she could be living in. So it looks like the person is violating the quantity maxim. So Grice thinks that, well, what's going, what does the audience think in this example? What do they make of the fact that the person appears to be violating the quantity maxim? Well, they search for an explanation. And a natural explanation in this case is that, well, maybe the person just doesn't know anymore. And they refuse to say anymore. Because if they said more than just that they're in the south of France, then they would be violating some different maxims. So, for instance, it might be that the speaker didn't say more because saying more might lead to saying something false or it would, or it would lead to saying something that they lack evidence for. So either way, saying more would involve a violation of the quality maxim to not say false things and to only say things that you have evidence for. And so in a case like this, Grice thinks, well, what happens is 
the best explanation of why the person falls short in the quantity maxim is that really they're trying to follow the quality maxims and it, and they want you to and they want you to realize that they don't know any more than what they've said and that they would have said more except that saying more would have violated quality so they realize they're falling short on quantity but the reason why they're doing that is they're trying to obey quality and they're thereby trying to communicate to you that they don't know any more than what they've literally said so that's an example that involves quality we can conclude we can conclude that somebody doesn't know any more than what they've said because that's the best explanation of why they would not follow quantity it's that they were trying to obey quality what about relation so let's think about an example that involves relation you should say at the top relation and quantity are, are kind of hard to distinguish because you might think well irrelevant information You might think, well, irrelevant information is always going to fall into the category of giving too much. So it's unclear whether Grice really needs both of these, but I'll just presume for now that relation is its own, should be its own category. So a kind of example Grice gives, which might be counted as a, a relate, a, an implicature involving relation, is an exchange like this. So somebody says, Smith doesn't seem to have a girlfriend these days. And then somebody else responds, well, he does seem to be visiting New York City a lot at the moment. So if you think just about the literal content of what the answer here, or the, the second part of the response is, the second part of the exchange is, it looks like it's not following the relation maxim. It looks like the person is not saying something relevant initially, if all you're going by is what the literal content. Because the conversation was about whether Smith has a girlfriend, and now this person is talking about whether he's going to New York or not. For just going by what's literally said, doesn't look like that's relevant to the conversation. But there's a, a very obvious extra thing the person could be suggesting, which would make what they're saying relevant, which is that Smith has a girlfriend in New York who he's visiting. So again, what what is happening here, Bryce thinks, is that we notice the speaker saying is saying something that looks irrelevant. It looks like it's not following the maxim of relation. We assume though that really in the sum total of what they're trying to say, they are following the maxim. So there must be something extra that they're saying, which would mean that they are obeying the maxim after all. What could that be? Well, in this case, the best explanation, given that they, what they were literally saying was that he was going to New York City very often, is that they're suggesting that Smith does have a girlfriend in New York City, because that then would make their utterance relevant. And so the appearance that they're violating the relation maxim is explained away. Let's last talk about manner. So when would you get a manner violation? Well, it's when you sort of, the way that you express yourself is kind of at odds with the idea of being clear or being unambiguous or being brief or being orderly. So one kind of example Grice gives is where you say something like, she opened her mouth and a series of sounds that resembled the national anthem emerged. Now, if all you were trying to do was say the national anthem, then that would be a pretty gross violation of manner because it's a kind of obscure, it's kind of clear, it's certainly not brief, it would be much longer saying the sentence, she opened her mouth and emitted a series of sounds that resembled the national anthem. That's much, much longer than just saying that she sung the national anthem. So the idea is, well, if that was all, what, if that was all you were trying to say, there would be a clear violation of at least one, maybe more than one manner maxim. So it can't be that all you're trying to do is say that you sung the national anthem. What else could you be saying that would explain the apparent violation of the manner maxim? Well, obviously that the person is not singing very well. That particular choice of words tends to suggest that the person didn't sing very well, because if all you wanted to say was that they sung well, was well, that you wouldn't have put it in such a convoluted way. You would have said something much simpler. So the apparent violation of, ma of manner gets explained away. What you're really trying to communicate is that they sung badly. So we now see an examples in each of these cases of how we can how we might use the maxims to get implicatures, and they all share a, a similar kind of feature. The idea is well, it's we start off by seeing that there's at least an apparent violation of a maxim, and then the audience has to try and explain away why that is because their initial presumption is that really the person is being cooperative, and that they have a reason for appearing to not be cooperative. So, basically, so then the audience sort of casts around, they think, well, what would be the best explanation 
for then breaking or appearing to break the maxim. And the implicature is basically whatever extra content would be needed to explain the apparent violation of the maxim. 